So, to start, I have a few objectives for this project, uh, for, this, for the next hour or so, what I want to be talking about. Uh, I'm talking about my original fieldwork that is not available anywhere else and hasn't really been done before. It's a comparative study through the post-Soviet region of street art, political street art, and, um, and how people express themselves in censored states. So these are my two primary arguments. One, street art is an effective medium of political expression and political discussion, uh, especially in closed, censored, authoritarian states. And the second, uh, in, the, in politicized regions, uh, public street art cannot function as simply art for art's sake which is a very popular way of looking at art that in a piece might, be, might appear to be political, but it is simply something that is coming from the artist to express themselves and may not have political intentions. So my argument is that when it is a politicized environment and it's in the public, there's no way that it can just be art for art's sake. This might look familiar. It's election day in Moscow in 2012. Uh, briefly before I talk about that, in Russia, a large number of the media outlets are state-owned or have been bought out by state-owned, bought out by state-owned gas companies. Independent journals and news outlets uh, allow, you know, independent journals and news do exist but a hierarchy of topic prevents journalists from doing their jobs and, frequent, and freely criticizing topics like, obviously, as you know, as, as uh, Chechnya, organized crime, top-tier corruption. Even Ekolmaksvi encountered state pressure during the March 2012 presidential election. Internet is fairly free. In Belarus, all news state-owned is, is uh, state and explicitly censored. <laughs> they're independent newspapers, but they encounter heavy pressure. They're closed down. They're raided. And you get bloggers like Anton Matolko thrown in jail. He has a personal blog, but he also occasionally gives work to Radio Svoboda. Um, so he has a semblance of freedom, but he's heavily monitored and constantly thrown into prison. And until recently, the Hungarian media boasted both publicly and privately owned radio stations. But those private radio stations have been threatened as um, state-associated individuals have been purchase purchasing them, the national public radios. Uh, so media law definitely threatens freedom in, of speech in Hungary as well. So as a result of those restrictions, you don't have free speech, you don't have the nightly news, you don't have perhaps uh, the newspapers that are also free, especially with the Olympics coming up, um, those wishing to express their political sentiment are forced to seek out alternative avenues of expression. So there are a few alternative avenues to using the media. You can march in the streets. And I've chosen these photos to illustrate March 4th, 2012. Like I said, election day in Russia. I saw, I was here on a scholarship from the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C. I saw thousands of riot police barricade Moscow's downtown public squares with rows of metal detectors ensuring that opposition demonstrations could not occur. Hundreds of military vehicles lined Red Square, Pushkinskaya Square, Mayakovskaya Square, Bolotnaya Square, Teletrania Square, demonstrating the regime's military might. And you see here the, the I'm sure you saw this, the, just the armed cars marching, uh, lining the street. So, 30,000 pro kremlin Nashi youth are also bused to Moscow from around the country to patrol these areas where the military vehicles could not fit, the city's underground passages, metro stations, back streets, to make sure nothing happened. Despite seemingly endless inertia and global media backing, opposition efforts have affected little change. Another option is the internet, or the blogs, blogosphere. Even on the web, on the internet, Free speech has limits. IP addresses can be traced. Uh, government employs hackers too, even the United States, everywhere. And private portals can be unlocked. And it compromises the safety of politically vocal bloggers. So in my opinion, the internet is not really a feasible option for free speech. 
Of course, you have rock music, and um, you're familiar with different examples of rock stars like Pussy Riot, who have expressed themselves politically and ended up in prison. Um, I'm not going to go there, but that's another way of expressing yourself. So it's easy to see why graffiti, graffiti would be an amenable medium for political discourse in Eastern Europe. One, it's anonymous and untraceable, allows its creator to freely criticize things that you wouldn't maybe want your name on. Two, uh, it reclaims the corporate-dominated public sphere and lets people share banned information, promote ignored causes, discuss so social problems, and even mobilize. And the fa final thing is, it's a satiric, it's an art of satire. And through satire, it can communicate this narrative of a city and pull down the political leader through, by, by making you know, the, the king into the joker and the every man into the king. So I'll talk more about that later. <laughs> but here's a, here's a slide of, this is Archon Los, Loskotov, and this is in St. Petersburg. I'll tell you a little bit about how post-server graffiti got started. I first explored the topic while studying at St. Petersburg State University in 2009. Every day I'm walking to my classes and I notice that, you know, on the walls the, the stencils are changing. So one day there's something about nuclear policy and the next day there's something about political leaders and the next day there's something else. While I was there, these stencils of Artem, Artem Leskotov came up, who is a activist uh, in, in uh, the Euro region. And he had already been out of jail for a year. So I thought it was really strange that they had these stencils that were coming up now a year later um, about freeing him and how art, you know, activism, art is not um, extremism. I thought it was very, very strange. And so I wondered if dissent, in fact, existed on the streets anonymously, honestly, unpunished, and uh, in whether it was just in St. Petersburg, whether it was throughout the post-Soviet region, or whether it was a global phenomenon. Uh, in February 2011, I saw Roger Gassman, who is an expert in his field uh, on street art, and he, I think he lives in Los Angeles. He gave a public lecture on the history of American street art uh, at the Washington, D.C. Corcoran Gallery of Art. Gassman said that in our Western society, the main purpose of dominating a public space with one pen is to achieve notoriety. To me, the art line east of Berlin seemed more politicized, more intentional, even more desperate than that found in the United States or Western Europe. Of course, there are always exceptions. And I was inspired by Gassman's lecture, and I, and I read through everything I could find on street art, dissent, nonconformist art, and it allowed me to clearly recognize the unusual aspects of this art form in the post-Soviet region. By June 2011, I was on a flight to Russia, thanks to a generous research scholarship from the Georgetown University, which is where I, went, which I, where I got my master's degree. Uh, on my fieldwork, I just spent months walking the region's alleys and underpasses. I found friends to house me. I sought out artists, activists, and politicians in Moscow studios, Budapest living rooms, just out of genuine eagerness to share their stories and to contribute to knowledge on the subject. I standardized my daily research by applying the same fieldwork methodology to each urban center. So everywhere I went, I noted the same characteristics so that I could compare, and I went to the same areas of every city so that I could compare the different images and to see maybe if there were some ways to contrast my findings. So I returned to Moscow in March 2012, and then I, you know, to collect testimonies during this heightened political period. And of course, I returned to F Berlin for fieldwork this June of 2013, and I was so lucky to return now to the NCCA uh, in December. So why do I want to do this? There's nothing on it. There's no literature. And then the, most no, no, the most notable text is from 1990, and it's an academic named John Bushnell at Northwestern University. Uh, he, he offers a really great assessment of Soviet graffiti in Moscow, of the fanati, of 
um, rock star, of rockers, of pacifists, of hippies. But when the Soviet Union falls, so too does his research. The overall purpose is to show that graffiti and street art are more than just acts of vandalism. They're actually rich alternative avenues of expression in a tightly controlled countries of the post-Soviet region. What started as a master thesis turned into something more. Uh, so I'll start with this slide. The contemporary public space is a public bar or a neighborhood, uh, a parade ground, and it remains neutral, voluntary, inclusive. The public space is a leveler in that it is accessible to the public, it lacks exclusive membership restrictions, and deconstructs the structures of social hierarchy. What I'm trying to say is anyone can come into the public space and feel like they belong. Whether they're rich, poor, literate, illiterate, black, white, healthy, sick, anyone can access the city's walls. The most cardinal and sustaining activity of the public space is communication. Thus, the public space remains a great place for unrestricted information sharing, questioning, protesting, forming opinion locally and collectively, which are all necessary practices for a functioning participatory system. The public space is where the citizenry can form ideas about their government, their society, and their loyalties. In a sense, the public space is a symbol of freedom, which gains its legitimacy and strength by means of public participation. Totalitarian governments are keenly aware of this fact and closely monitor or discourage via buff or consequences the heated discourse that incubates in the informal gathering space. Though not published between two book covers, graffiti expresses a great city narrative. I love the chronotope. Uh, and I enjoy playing around with it and applying it to non-traditional narratives. In Bakhtin's Chronotype of the Rebelais, the new reality, the carnivalesque, fully inverts existing norms of power and social hierarchy. In the carnivalesque, authenticity, laughter, and truth deconstruct the corporate world. The foremost devices of this chronotope are humor, vulgarity, and a rejection of authority. Closely, resemble those of the graffiti realm. The carnivalesque about growth and uh, through in the public sphere seems to be the perfect space to carry out a radical disavowal of the corporate world. Just as the carnivalesque ritual of reversal, the king is demoted to joker and the joker promoted to a position of power. And so here you have several leaders of the several totalitarian leaders of our world. You have uh, Gaddafi and Mugabe in the Ahmadinejad, and actually you see the second to the left, Gaddafi is uh, someone who decapitated him and put maybe bullets through his head, and you see that he's gone. And by making these cartoon-like characters, uh, caricatures of, of people who do horrible things to their citizens, um, the artist can, the artist has a certain power over the way that they are perceived in general society they are made fun of. When people laugh at a political leader who rules with a heavy hand, that political leader loses power to some degree. So I really like this image. Here's, uh, if, you, if you're familiar with Hungarian politics, this is the leader of Hungary, Viktor Orban. And of course, uh, it says Vicky Mouse, and he has Mickey Mouse ears. And again, it, by making fun of a political leader in a very public way, you have influence, you, you're able to influence the way that that leader is perceived. And that's a really powerful ability uh, for a street artist, I think. And all these photos are mine. Um, so here you have uh, the idea of ideological propagation using graffiti. So you create this reality where, yes, above on the top is Putin on election night uh, with Medvedev and they're speaking to the crowd. But there are so many pictures of him, as you see in the bottom, and the graffiti and the stickers that are propagated over the town. It's almost as though the reproductions of Putin 
the symbol and its associated message, they become a fictitious yet authorita uh, authoritative dominator over truth. It's as though the image that is propagated becomes more real than the real Putin. You know, you see on TV or you see in pictures and you see um, in all these constructed ways, it almost feels more real than when you're actually standing there and you see the, the, the leader himself or herself and, uh, and they don't even feel real. And actually, uh, the one on the right is b right below uh, where, the, where this gathering was on election night. So then there's a mass reproduction of symbols and every time you create this picture of Putin and put it in the street, every time you create this picture of anyone, Victor Orban dressed as Mickey Mouse, every time you create it, you kind of break down the real figure. You break down the original and to some degree you empty it of its meaning, its value, maybe even its authority. Uh, when the form is propagated, the real is devalued. Perhaps you, you see the actual person in reality and you don't say, oh, this person is my leader because it feels like they're so, you're so desensitized to their existence, I don't know. So Marsha McLuhan is a Canadian theorist who talks, who's, whose main idea is the medium is the message. So I liked that these stencils are kind of a metacriticism on unfree societies. On the left is in Hungary and it, on the left of the left, it talks about the freedom, it's a freedom of speech criticism and the person's eyes are covered. On the right, you have, I love, you know, I love free press, I love independent courts. And the fact that these things are written on the walls implies that they don't have other avenues through which they can um, make these complaints heard. It seems strange that you would be going home, buying paint or stealing paint, creating a stencil, thinking the idea, planning when you're going to do it, finding a good space for it, create the stencil on the wall about freedom of speech if it's really not an issue. So I think that it, it really shows the medium is the message. And if there was freedom of speech, people wouldn't be writing it on the walls. <laughs> so um, it, 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 it really carefully expresses the unrestricted quality of this art form. So just to bring it back, graffiti is political. When it takes place in a political, politicized space, it's, uh, there's no way it can just be art for art's sake. And it's a great and effective medium for expression, political expression, especially in closed societies. So here I'm showing some pictures that I've taken. Uh, the ones on the left are in St. Petersburg, and the ones on the right are in Moscow. Are you OK up there, Maria? OK, you're good. OK, I stopped hearing you. So. Um, and the ones on the right are in Moscow. And uh, this, this ones on the left are a group called the Group of Change. And you can and you notice that they have their live, well, in, in the bottom one, they have their live journal listed. And they, they do a lot of organizing in St. Petersburg. So you can look at a graffiti, see the website, go to the website, find out on the walls where an action is taking place, also follow it on the website, also follow it on Twitter, and have a real-time understanding of where these actions are taking place, at what time, you know, maybe they're changing location. Uh, so I think that that's a really valuable uh, characteristic of graffiti. I, I, was, in, I was in Moscow um, during a, a politicized time and I felt that I could walk out of the metro and there would be a wall outside where I was staying at Elektrozavodskaya. And you could, it would say, you know, we're we'll having a meeting at four o'clock in this place and then it would be crossed out and it would say five o'clock. And then by the time I got there, and, you know, maybe it was somewhere else and I looked at my my phone and the Twitter said, okay, it's here. So it's nice to supplement your information between graffiti and technology. I think that it just makes 
uh, a movement more connected. And it makes mobilizing easier, I think, for the organizers, because someone who might not be connected to the internet might see something on the streets. And they might be inspired to participate. Also, a lot of the information on the internet is pretty skeletal in that it's, uh, it's, it's not including a lot of information. It, there's so much information that everything becomes, point, it becomes meaningless. <laughs> and um, so when you reinforce with tangible words on the street, I think that that brings a lot of meaning to a statement as well. Uh, the next slide is the concept, I'm sure some of you have seen this too, it's at, it was at Vinzavod uh, in March 2012. Uh, this is the idea that street discourse is happening, it's not just one voice, it's, uh, it's a conversation between multiple people. Uh, I saw the top stencil on a Sunday, on the 2nd of March 2012, on election day, it was erased uh, on the 4th, and then on the next day, you know, someone wrote in English, sorry. So you can see that um, there's a conversation taking place. It's not just one person. So I think that, that that's interesting. I also think it's interesting why someone would write in English. Uh, when I was in Belarus, I know that there was a specific reasoning for that expressed to me by some of the artists with whom I spoke. Uh, they said that they, specifically in Minsk, th this artist said that they chose to write in English because there are very few tourists in Minsk and some of them would take pictures and put it online and then that image would be circulated within, um, within a Western press. That's what he said. And he said it's also cool, according to him. So, I don't know. I don't know if it's cool, but yeah. Here's another example of graffiti discourse, and this is one of my favorite pictures because there's a lot going on here. Uh, this is in this is in Prague in Czech Republic, and you know it's just a, it's a side alleyway, and you have the big picture of Che Guevara wearing a Che Guevara T-shirt. And if any of you remember, you know, Che Guevara T-shirts are very cool if you're revolution-minded. So you have Che Guevara wearing his own face, again, desensitizing the viewer to the image of Che Guevara, because you've seen it so many times uh, on posters and on stickers and on t-shirts that the actual Che Guevara would, would, uh, it would feel less real, I think. And then we have Yuri says, Yuri Gagarin says, reach for the stars, in English again, to which someone replied, Russian go home, all in English, all in Prague, where people you know, speak Czech, so I'm not sure what their intention was in, in writing in, in English. But, and then on the right you have uh, GDR. So I think it's a great example of, these are all likely different artists, they're not the same person, and there's a conversation going on. And there's also some reference here to, to history, because why would you be in Prague writing about Soviet or Russian influence um, because that's what your collective identity, that's what your memory is. So um, this, I think this, this is a really telling photo of what, what the street narrative is uh, in that city. And it's, and it's angry, right? <laughs> Russian go home, it's angry, it's, it's rude. Um, so that's what I saw there. So now I want to talk a little bit about social responsibility. If uh, you're familiar with the Moscow street art scene. Uh, Kirill Kato is a, is a leader in the scene. He used to run the Wall Project, but now Misha Most runs it. Uh, and he's involved with various projects at Vinzavod. He's involved with partisaning and, um, and some of his own projects. So this is not one of his pieces. This is in Berlin. But Kirill Kato has this big idea that it's a social responsibility to when you have an open space on the wall to write about social or political issues. It is not enough to write your name. It's not enough to do name graffiti. It's not enough to scribble something um, about your crew. Uh, in fact, he, he says if you are just writing your name, you are agreeing with the social, with the social norm, you're agreeing that the way things are going is the way that you want them to be going. 
And he says that you, you have a serious responsibility as an artist, and especially as an artist that creates work that belongs in the public space. Again, remember that the public space is available to everyone, no matter young, old, black, white, sick, healthy, illiterate, literate, anything. Um, you have a really big responsibility to those people who are going to walk by and see your work to say something that is meaningful um, and thoughtful and aware and thought-provoking as well. So, um, so the conversation goes as follows. Then Misha Most replies and he says, well, what if you're a runner and you're training for a marathon and someone runs up to you and says, hey, stop running, stop training for a marathon because you're wasting your energy and your energy could be conserved and it could be put towards something so much more important. Is that correct? Is that right? Is that wrong? So the question here is, <laughs> if you're an artist, are you supposed to be, in a, you're an artist in a politicized state in the public sphere, like a graffiti artist, are you supposed to be creating something with your talent? Or can you just write your name? Is that OK? And that's the big debate. Uh, ooh. So Kuro Kato was originally a member of Moscow's Zachim crew. He lifts slogans from Kremlin-friendly youth organizations and paints them on luxury cars as a way of spotlighting the connection between money and power. He writes many manifestos on the walls of Moscow that assail political apathy and institutionalized crime. When the powers that be abruptly decided to replace the longtime Moscow mayor, Yuri Lushkov, with a Kremlin insider named Sergei Sobyanin, in 2010, Kto used the city's walls to send the new mayor a message. So Bianin, he said, you're just a baby. Don't disappoint me. Kto combines code from pop culture and modern culture and politics in his art. There's a tacit consent among writers, he says, that we have the tools and therefore the responsibility to tell something as it truly is. This was in a February um, 2012 interview that we did. Still, most continue to write their names, which to me only confirms their so social lethargy and indifference to political change. To me, name graffiti and loyalty to the existing regime are one and the same. If you are quietly engaged in your own business and do not react in any way to an event in society, then you agree with the current political and social course. The, gen the general right of expression in the street on any theme is fiction and voluntarism. You should be reliable for a place, and you should write there impudently. It's a pretty strong statement, and, um, and I, I, I really like the, converse, the dialogue about that topic. So what Kirill Kato does is he sees someone write their name, and he'll cover it with a meta, meta buff. He'll cover it with a, a, just a fake brick or something to show that he sees them and that he monitors his neighborhood, um, kind of like a social critic, social critique. Um, kind of like he's the, he's cleaning up after everybody else. Instead of just buffing it out, he does a specific symbol that kind of shows them that they are not being responsible with the ability that they have to really make a difference. So what I have here is this is obviously the Berlin Wall. You can see this is in Berlin. And uh, it's, it's actually right outside of a grocery store, which I think is very funny. And as the Berlin Wall falls, it goes back up, and it's made of euros. So you, you see, I'm just trying to show an example of an artist that uses takes advantage of their abilities and their talent to create something that makes people think. You're coming out of the grocery store and you're purchasing items that you could grow or maybe you know someone else who could grow them, but instead you're purchasing them and they've been imported from other countries that are undernourished and you walk out the door with your cart full of stuff and you see this and, and maybe it makes you think. So I think that, um, that his, this artist's decision to do this project is, is exactly what Kato is talking about, is social responsibility. And here's another one from St. Petersburg. 
an artist that chose to create, you see around it, you have like a lot of mean graffiti, a lot of garbage. And I love garbage, it's, everyone does it, it's fun. But a lot of things that aren't, don't have meaning to the viewer. But then you have this tree, what was once a tree, with nuclear waste around the base, exploding into a nuclear bomb explosion, and that, again, resembles maybe what, what might be a tree in its, in its dust shadow. So it's another example. This artist didn't have to create something that was socially responsible, but chose to. And um, that's kind of what I look at. I, I don't really look at the name graffiti so much, but often people ask me, well, what about that? And so that's my opinion. What about that is that there are so, there's so many important things in the world, and there's so much intolerance and injustice that to write your name, I kind of agree with Creole Coteau, to write your name is, um, seems, seems like a waste to some degree. I think that there are a lot more important issues that need to be addressed, but it is a sport, and I understand that. Uh, so now we're going to talk a little bit about memory. What's the point? Playing around with historical collective identity and untouchable icons. One of my favorite photos, this is from Munkach, which is a city in the Ukraine. It used to be Hungary. Uh, now it's Munkachevo. In, in Hungarian, it's Munkach. Uh, so it used to be a Jewish town. It used to be like 44% Jewish. There used to be a bunch of yeshivas, Jewish schools, and the center of town used to be um, a lot of prominent Jewish families. It was known for its scholars. And obviously when the war happened, uh, the people were shipped out first into a factory on the outside of town and then onto a train into Auschwitz. And what remained of the town was nothing. I mean, the, the, the whole Jewish population was wiped out. And what you see here is a building that once belonged to a Jewish family in the center of town that was then taken by another family, which is another political issue. But, and then eventually you see it's, it's falling apart. You know, the walls are falling. So on this wall, the artist chose to write Zachor, which in Hebrew, it's Hebrew, uh, which in Hebrew means remember. And specifically, it means remember the Holocaust. So you can see on the letters of the Hebrew letters, it has the yellow, uh, like the yellow armbands that the, the Jewish people had to wear. So that's an interesting, interesting way of looking at memory. And it's something that I didn't, I don't generally see in the United States so much as uh, this talk on the streets in street art narrative about the war. Uh, you, don't, you just don't see it in the States, and you see it everywhere here. In St. Petersburg on the ground, you have, you know, this spot, this person passed away. Or I was, I was at Memorial the other day, and they were telling me about, you know, they're doing a project here. On this spot, this person once lived before they were sent to the Gulag. So there's a big effort to use graffiti in these memory, in ways of memory. You also, in Lutz, Lodz, Lodz, Poland, people say it differently. Um, you have graffiti marking the lines of the ghetto where the, where the Jews were held before they were sent to the camps. Uh, so I have another, a couple of more pictures. One second, please. And this talks a little bit about the prominence of culture-based national identity and collective memory in the face of Eastern Europe's constantly changing boundaries. Here you have, we want the wall back, and it's written on the Berlin Wall. And, and there's nothing very visually striking except for the, the way that the paint is, but I mean, really it's a simple statement and why it's in English too, if it's we want the wall back. I'm not sure why it would be in English. Um, perhaps the artist was trying to speak to a certain audience. Um, but I think that graffiti can be used in really amazing ways to talk about political identity and memory. Uh, in Osh, this is not in Osh, this is in Riga, but in Osh, um, I, I, did, I did some research on a, a project there where people of the two ethnic groups dur during and after the Civil War there in 
a few years ago, they would mark, you know, the houses. So many Uzbeks lived here, so many Kyrgyz lived here, you know, three Kyrgyz lived here, and they would cross the numbers out, and they would say two Kyrgyz lived here, or one Kyrgyz, or none, or, you know, this is a Kyrgyz zone. And if you were also Kyrgyz, you would know that you were safe there. Or you could use graffiti as a targeting tool and go to those neighborhoods or go to those houses and know where to find your enemy. So it's also could possibly be a tool for violence. Uh, this is a really neat picture. This is from Riga. And on the left, you have the Regan Independence Monument, which is in the middle of town. Uh, it's from the 1920s, early 1920s, and it stayed up through the Soviet Union. At the top of the monument, you have a woman, their version of Lady Liberty, holding three stars above her head. It's huge, it's a beautiful monument. Then on the right, you have this street art depiction of her, of Lady Liberty, but she's engorged, she's a bit plump now, and she has also the three stars, and she's going through a meat grinder, um, perhaps implying that Latvian or Baltic even identity, you know, whether it was during the Soviet Union or during the post-Soviet European Union process has put its identity and its pride that it earned through a metaphorical meat grinder. It's a nice image. And finally, this one's in Berlin, and um, I guess it's pretty self-explanatory. I found this one in June 2013, and the artist depicted this young, super thin woman, kind of the way that you see the survivors when the camps were liberated, and she's jumping rope with a barbed wire. And you can see her, her bones on her arms, on the, especially on the right. And it's just so interesting to me that, that that's a part of the street narrative, that in Berlin, someone would create a three-story tall monument or a mural of Anne Frank, or someone would create um, this stencil at home, a girl who looks like a camp survivor at the liberation, jumping rope with barbed wire, it's, it takes a lot of thought to go into what you create. And I think, I think that that understanding alone, that when you see something on the street, the thought that goes into it, that's really meaningful. Um, and it, it, makes, it certainly makes you think about Germany's relationship with its identity and its history. Um, so you see a lot. You see a lot of war references in Eastern Europe in general, but in Germany in particular, I saw a lot of Holocaust stuff. On a particularly gray and hazy Muscovite dawn, Misha Most carefully painted Article 29 of the Russian Constitution onto a wall adjacent to the Kremlin. Everyone shall be guaranteed the freedom of ideas and speech, he spelled in thick black letters near a still empty parking lot. The old paint on the government building was chipping and the cold nipped at his exposed skin. Most, grim most grimaced, wet his brush, and continued to write. No one may be forced to express his views and convictions or to reject them, dripped a second bullet point. A Kremlin guard stood by with a dull boredom as a young man completed his work. The freedom of mass communication shall be guaranteed and censorship shall be banned. The constitutional passage exhibited in the public sphere for three weeks before it was buffed by order of the Russian government. Misha Most is a graffiti artist and his wall painting was an illegal work. On the streets, graffiti depict political leaders in compromising states and construction contracts as corrupt. But in interviews that I did, a lot of the artists continue to reaffirm that their work is apolitical. Um, for example, Misha Most claims that this constitutional reference was a social critique. But I don't think that when street art contributes to a politically explicit discourse during a politicized period in a high traffic neighborhood, the message therein expressed is first and foremost political. So for an artist to claim that their work is not political, it's just a piece in the public sphere intended to engage the space and the viewer through placement, context, and aesthetics, I, I don't agree with. I think that 
maybe it's plausible deniability, the ability to walk away when someone says, well, you created this, and say, oh, it's not political. It's just social. Just telling people to speak up freely. I'm not sure against two if it's not political. Um, maybe it's just relative to more explicitly political acts that land one in jail. For example, collectives like Vaina or Pussy Riot. Um, compared to them, an artist might hesitate to classify their work as political, and that seems rational. Doing so perhaps even cheapens their artistic abilities and um, hones skills to, the, to that of mere activists. And obviously, these artists are much more, uh, they have a lot of talent. They're, they're not just activists. They also use their art to express activism. Um, regardless, when an artist releases their work anonymously into the politicized public sphere, the message is subject to what the viewer thinks, the viewer contextual interpretation. Without an explanatory placard or gallery introduction, and sometimes even with these tools, the artwork will be interpreted not as the artist assumedly intended, but rather as it exists within that viewer's mind. And so me, I'm interpreting this as how how could the how could the government have this article number twenty nine and and not stand by it? How could it be um, creating situations of censorship in the media and still have this as a part of their constitution? To me, it's very political. Um, but the artist himself believes that it's social, which perhaps means people should speak up about things that upset them which is a very nuanced difference, I think. Um, and I'm not sure I totally see the difference, and maybe that's a, that's a cultural difference. I don't know. So just to give you some context, in the global, in the global scene, I, I brought in some pictures that I took in other places that I've been or lived. Uh, this is in Montreal. It's a city in Canada. And so there were Vancouver Olympics in 2010, and um, there was a problem during the Vancouver Olympics that there was a big opposition movement against the Olympics by the natives who were there previously to the Canadians, like many countries who have um, conflicts with their native groups who have treated them in violent, negative ways. Um, so this, in English, says no Olympics on stolen native land. It also says it in French first, because that's how it goes in Montreal. French is always first, um, legally. So, and it has the picture of a native-looking symbol tearing up the Olympic rings. And in my opinion, around the world, it's, it's really the groups that are marginalized that are using graffiti for political purposes. So, in North America, it's only, I think it's only really the groups that are marginalized that are making political statements. You don't see so much stuff about I don't know, this leader and that leader, you do see it on occasion, but it's, it's definitely, I think, a little less common um, than it is, I think it's a more politicized environment here. So this is New Orleans. This is after Katrina. Hurricane Katrina was a, was a terrible environmental tragedy that destroyed entire neighborhoods, wiped them out, where all there's left is a basement and a couple steps, and there's no building left, there's no home left, and people were pushed out of their homes, people died, people got very sick, people did not have food, people were treated very poorly by the government. Um, so these groups would come in to New Orleans and they would, um, it's my mid, that was my Midwestern, I guess New Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans. But they would come in and they would check each house and they would say, well, we're group, you know, GR and we, there are, we know that there's one family that lives here and X, you know, there's no one here. We didn't find any bodies. And so what, what an artist came and did afterwards was took, and they did it in graffiti. They would spray paint it. You know, this is the day we checked this house. We're this group. This is what we found. Hopefully nothing. Better to find nothing. So, um, so they, they just created a kind of an art that, literally just went over the shadow of the graffiti, kind of a memorial, a memorial to the people that once lived in these homes in Louisiana before the hurricane. Then you have this in Detroit, which is where I live. 
And it says it's a it's a old factory on Piquette Street, which is a big you know, it, once upon a time, it was where all the cars were made. And it says, at least Katrina was quick. At least the hurricane happened fast, implying that in Detroit, it took 40 years for, it took 40 years for the same devastation to some degree to, um, to occur. Because you see behind the building, it's, uh, it's falling apart. It's totally decrepit. And there's a lot of interesting stuff like that there. So, so what? Conclusion, not only is street art in its turns to jokes, anecdotes, and linguistic play often designed to awaken the apathetic masses from their collective slumber, but it's also part of an outlet of expression that might not be available elsewhere. During this lecture, we discussed that, one, graffiti is an effective tool for political expression for marginalized groups or those in censored or closed states. Two, bottom-up opposition efforts are alive and functioning. Three, satirical discourse can affect the distribution of power. Four, street art reflects a greater narrative and can be read as such, a street narrative. Five, street art is a truly unrestricted mobilizing force. Six, humor in street art allows for the deconstruction of revered icons. I don't know if anyone has seen um, the, all, there's always Tsar stuff, Tsar Nicholas stuff at Vinzavod. And um, by putting the Tsar's head, Nicholas II's head, on this mythical creature's body, it, it totally demystifies the historical, um, I guess, legend. So anyway, so de deconstructing revered icons. And, and lastly, everyone has access to this form of dissent. Everyone. And all you need, well, as long as state oppression and media censorship continue, Critical minds will continue to seek out alternative avenues of expression, of course. And if, um, if the recent past is any indication, all you need is a spray can and an independent outlook and maybe even a sense of humor uh, to, I think, really change some minds and to have some real discourse on the streets that could be really meaningful. Um, that's it. Thanks for coming. Yay.